I'm Kathy Keel. I'm the chair of the Department of Economics and Accounting here at the college. Um, we have three panelists, um, so I'll introduce each one as we go. And unless one of the panelists objects, we'll hold questions for the end. And I'll have them come sit up here and we can uh, have more of a dialogue. Uh, so our first speaker is Maria Paganelli, who is an associate professor of economics at Trinity University. Uh, she does work on Adam Smith, David Hume, and 18th century monetary theories um, with focuses on links between the Scottish Enlightenment and behavioral economics. If that's not a liberal arts topic, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, so she'll be speaking. She has about 20 minutes or so for a presentation. So. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, quite a pleasure to see so many people interested in Smith. Uh, oh, I will say that is, I'm very pleased to see so many people interested in Smith. So thank you so much again for inviting me here. Um, I will talk about Adam Smith um, in relationship to markets and morality. And I will give you a warning, which is this is a very partial uh, reading of Smith. Um, I'm conscious about it because of, for questions of time, I just focus on the positive part, not on the negative part, in the sense that I'm looking exclusively at this point at Smith's potential approach to morality market, um, and I'm not looking at the criticism that Smith makes um, of markets and the negative effects that they may have on, on morality. So with that in mind, um, what I, the question that motivated my, this work is, is it possible to have a relationship between markets and morality? And is it possible that this relationship is positive? And the context of my question comes basically after uh, 2008, when uh, markets have been accused of generating immoral behavior. And, and so like the, 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 my answer is consciously partial on, let's see if it is possible to have a positive relationship between markets and morality. And the way in which I address uh, this question is by looking at both Adam Smith and experimental economics. So why should we care about the relationship between markets and morality? Well, because morality tends to be a very cheap law enforcement. It's much cheaper to engage with somebody that actually respects his contract because he thinks it's the right thing to do than with somebody who instead um, is uh, respecting the contract simply because of fear of law enforcement. It is, um, it is fairly well documented that uh, countries that have high level of trust have higher uh, level of economic growth, which is another way of saying um, morality is a relatively cheap um, enforcement of contract which decreases transaction costs and facilitate growth. So the way in which I look at uh, the relationship between markets and morality is uh, by looking at the relationship going from markets to morality. So how markets can affect morality. And then I also look at eventually how, mar how morality may affect markets. But what I care at this point is can we go from markets to morality? And I see in Adam Smith at least, at least three ways to justify the presence of commerce or markets in a positive way, in the sense that markets foster moral development. And uh, I can see in Smith uh, at least three ways. One is that markets support life, markets support liberty, and markets support impartiality. And if we assume that life, liberty, and impartiality are three good things to have, then we can see why markets are good things to have. Why does um, Smith, or how does Smith claim that markets suppose, um, <coughs> can support life and therefore there is a positive relationship between markets and morality? Well, Smith tells us that in uh, non-commercial society, people are poor. 
and poverty is not always the best environment to support virtue. So it tells us that in non-commercial society, poverty can be so striking that people are forced to leave, and I, I cite this because I really love the language, uh, to leave children, elderly, and sick to be devoured by wild beasts. <laughs> it just makes a wonderful image that it, that it gives us. Uh, but he said, and this happens only in non-commercial society when poverty is striking. In commercial society, we become rich enough to be able to support our children, our elderly, and our sick, so that we are not forced to abandon them to be devoured by wild beasts. It gives us also another example um, of uh, poverty that leads to immoral behavior, or what he considers immoral behavior, which is China. So in China, there are parts of China where poverty is so striking that, that the, poor, the poorest part of the population abandons children um, on the side of the road so that they can be drowned like puppies. Again, these are very powerful images. Like they yell at a child and drown him like a puppy so that you can dispose of that because you're not able to support it. These uh, practices for Smith are abhorrent. The, the, the either drowning children like puppies or letting them be devoured by wild beasts. And this practice are abandoned in commercial society because commerce allows you to, to have enough wealth to support all of them. The other reason why Smith, I believe, supports a positive relationship between markets and morality is because Smith believes that liberty is a moral value to support, and whatever support liberty is Good. Market supports support liberty. And this is one of the reasons why market support liberty according to Smith. In uh, non commercial society, in, in relationship among individuals tend to be personal. This is not a good thing according to Smith. Personal relationships are relationships that imply dependency. What it means is that you have a lord on which you depend. And it is a personal relationship because you and you are dependent on your Lord. So it is a personal connection between you and your Lord. If uh, your Lord doesn't like you, you are in trouble because there's nothing you can do. You depend on your Lord, which means that your Lord can be tyrannical and you have no escape route. So. In non-commercial society, personal relationships are definitely not conveying of freedom because of the, the personal link that you have. On the other hand, when commerce is introduced, what happens is that the relationship becomes impersonal. You do not depend on your lord anymore. You are not the shoemaker of your lord. So your lord is not the only customer that you have. You may have a thousand lords meaning that you have a thousand customers. But you are not dependent on each one of them uh, in particular. So this breaking of the, personal, of the personal relationship into impersonal relationship allows you to multiply the, the laws that you uh, depend on, which means that if one is bad, it's not going to affect you that much because you have other 999 on which you can, um, you, can, you can have trade with. So when you introduce commerce, you break the personal relationship, you introduce impersonal relationship, and that fosters freedom, or that is part of uh, an answer to freedom. And this is one of the many examples in which it tells you that the introduction of commerce and manufacturer um, bring uh, liberty and security of individuals and because they avoid servile dependency upon their superior. The third reason why I believe Smith uh, can help us understand why markets support morality is because Smith tells us that market may um, help us in developing impartiality. 
the, uh, we heard before about um, the impartial spectator. My account of the impartial spectator for this story is that the impartial spectator is not something outside us, but it's something within us. But we are not born with an impartial spectator. Our impartial spectator is actually partial at birth. It is me, 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 me that um, the first presentation was about. Um, we learn impartiality by interacting with others. Just like we learn the depth of, his, of distance by seeing with our physical eye. So if something is too close to us, it becomes very big, and you can do it very easily by taking a piece of paper and put it close to your nose and try to read it. You can't read if something is, is attached to your nose because the letter becomes so big and they, they, they blur. On the other hand, if something is, very few of you should be able to read this sign because it's too far away. The letter becomes very, very tiny. So the, if something is very close to you, become, is, becomes very, very big, and if something is far away, it becomes very, very tiny. In order for you to read something, you have to place it not too close, not too far from you. And similarly, Smith tells us, in order to, um, to see uh, our circumstances, we can't be too close to them, nor too far away from them. If we are too close, those, our circumstances become immense. Right? And so a paper cut, for example, I'm making the example up, but a paper cut is the end of the world for me because it's my finger on which I got the paper cut. As me tells her, if you lose your, your pinky finger, um, you don't sleep at night because it's your pinky finger. On the other hand, as me tells you, if something is too far away, you don't care about them because they're so far away. So Chinese people, the China is swallowed by an earthquake, eh, who cares? There, there are many of them, but they're far away, so they're not my problem. So what we need to do is try to develop the right distance to evaluate behavior. And uh, how do we do it? Well, we, we heard uh, earlier this morning, we put ourselves with our imagination in the place of another person, and we look at ourselves from that perspective, from that point of view. So I have my paper cut on my, on my finger, and I'm about to cry because I'm desperate because I have a cut on my, on my, on my little finger and it burns a little, or a lot. But I'm now here crying because, I, who, what is your name? Yes, Justin. Justin. Because I, I, I have Justin in front of me whom I don't know. And if I start screaming and yelling that I have a paper, a paper cut on my finger, I think, that fucking idea is. <laughs> so, and I, I put myself in his place, and I think, if I were Justin, and I look at Maria screaming and yelling for a paper cut, I would think she's insane. <laughs> and so I would disapprove of my behavior if I were Justin. So I don't scream and yell because of the paper cut. So I control my passions by putting myself in the place of another and looking at me as if I were this other person. The problem is, are people, are everybody, is just the right person for me to look at myself? Smith would tell me, yes, Justin is a perfect person. <laughs> Why? Because I don't know Justin. I just saw him here for the first time. I see him, but I don't know him. If, on the other hand, I would run to my mother, say, Mom, I have a paper cut. My mom said, oh, my poor baby, you're so cute. Your things are going to be OK. But my mom is going to give me more compassion than Justin would. Justin would think you're insane. My mom would say, oh, my poor little baby. So my mother is going to give me much more, or it's going to indulge me much more in my passion, I'm using Smith's word, than Justin would. So close family and close friends are not necessarily the best people to develop impartiality because they're very close to us and they're going to let us indulge in our passions. Strangers, on the other hand, are much more objective of, um, of our paper cuts. And so by putting myself in the place of a stranger 
I'm much more likely to develop impartiality than putting myself in the place of my mom that's going to love me much more than Justin. So Smith tells us, you want to be around strangers in order to develop impartiality. It's the best environment for you to develop impartiality. And what is a society of strangers? Well, a commercial society. Small societies like feudal society are very personal societies, so you're not interacting with strangers. Market society, commercial society are society of strangers instead. And so this is another way of saying that Smith may think of markets as fostering morality because of market uh, being society of strangers. This is one of the several examples where Smith tells us that strangers are good for us because they help us develop impartiality. Our university, do not mourn in the darkness of solitude, do not regulate your sorrow according to the indulgent, indulgent sympathy of your intimate friends. So don't go to your mother. <laughs> Return as soon as possible, daylight of the world into society, live with strangers. With those who know nothing or care nothing about your misfortune. Because those are the ones with whom you are forced to put yourself into the shoes of, and therefore become more objective and more impartial in your judgment. The other uh, way of looking at the relationship to markets and morality is see if it is possible to have um, markets without morality. And uh, I believe that Smith would say no. You need to have both. So m it is true that markets foster morality, but you need to have mo morality in order to um, have a functioning market. And indeed, if you do, ha do not have uh, morality, in, uh, in markets, you're going to have a collapse of it. They're going to collapse, and society is going to, to, uh, to collapse. And the example that he gives us are examples that come from uh, lobbying. Um, lobbying, in particular, he thinks of the East Indian Company, that is a monopoly is meant to attract benefits for themselves at the expense of everybody else. And what the East Indian Company does is generate death. Why? Because Bengal, is the example that he uses, is a very fertile country. But yet, thousands of people each year die of starvation because of the monopoly imposed by the East Indian Company. So this is an example of a distortion of, of markets caused by the greed of the big merchant manufacturers that is going to collapse, to force markets into collapse. So Smith can tell us a nice story that there is a positive relationship between markets and morality. But is it right? Well, we can test. And uh, there are at least a, a couple, some studies that can lead you into the, the direction of saying, yes, Smith is right. There are studies done in the field and in the lab, experimental study done in the field and in the lab. And uh, the field study tells us that um, under certain conditions, it is possible to see that there is a positive correlation between market integration, which is exposure to markets, and cooperation. And uh, similarly, in the lab, it is possible to see that under a specific condition, it is possible to see an increase in trust when you're exposed to markets. And I am not going to explain this, but if you're interested, you can ask me in the, um, in the Q&A. Uh, but this is the design of the game that we had to test whether um, it is possible to observe a, um, a positive effect of markets on uh, trust. And uh, so I would like to conclude by reiterate the fact that um, I believe that it is possible that under to, to consider markets as a as uh, moral, that, that markets and morality do not have to be in, in opposition necessarily. They can, but not necessarily. 
and, uh, and by looking at Adam Smith, uh, we can learn how it is possible to justify it. And by looking at experimental economics, we are able to see in a lab or in the field whether that is the case or not. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, our second speaker is Spencer Pack. Uh, he is a professor of economics at Connecticut College. He has his PhD from the University of New Hampshire. He's written several books, including Aristotle, Adam Smith, and Karl Marx on some fundamental issues in 21st century political economy. So, thank you. Well, I was asked to write uh, for, an, for a handbook on uh, managers' ethics, I think it was. Uh, these people asked me to write something on Smith's virtue, ethics, and capitalism. What is in need of revision? I think some other people are also contributing to that handbook. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So uh, Smith's virtues, ethics, and capitalism, what is in need of revision? I'm trained as an economist. Most of this, what I know, uh, it's going to be critical of capitalism. Um, Smith's virtue ethics looks pretty good to me, I'd say that. Uh, Smith's virtue ethics may give excellent guidance for today's globalized commercial society. Moreover, just as Smith used his moral sentiments, virtues, and imagined impartial spectator to criticize the capitalism of his day, so we may use our corresponding faculties to criticize 21st century contemporary capitalism. Smith's in incommensurable virtues depend upon various sentiments, the ability to sympathize with others, and self-control of our passions. So, for example, the virtue of justice depends upon the sentiment resentment. For Smith, resentment seems to have been given to us by nature for defense and for defense only. It is a safeguard of justice and the security of innocence. Justice is therefore a virtue. The violation of it is injury. So the state should punish those who are appropriately resented. Some people may have too little resentment of an injury, a vice, much more likely they'll have too much resentment, which would be a more common vice. Hence the need for self-control of our resentment and basically all our other passions. Out of our ability to sympathize with others, we learn to observe our own behavior through the eyes of other spectators, what we've been talking about today. That is, we initially judge other people's character and conduct. Over time, we realize that they too judge us. Subsequently, we suppose ourselves the spectators of our own behavior. For Smith, quote, this is the only looking glass by which we can, in some measure, with the eyes of other people, scrutinize the propriety of our own conduct. Well, it's a sociological type story uh, we're in societies. Hence, we, quote, come to endeavor to examine our own conduct as we imagine any other fair and impartial spectator would examine it. Finally, in a virtuous person, this developed, supposed, imagined, impartial spectator becomes internalized. The decision, quote, of the man within the breast, the supposed impartial spectator, the great judge and arbiter of our conduct. If we place ourselves completely in his situation, if we really view ourselves with his eyes and as he views us and listen with diligent and reverential attention to what he suggests, his voice will never deceive us. So, returning to the virtue justice and the laws which develop concerning justice, Quote, proper resentment for injustice attempted or actually committed is the only motive which in the eyes of the impartial spectator can justify our hurting or disturbing in any respect the happiness of our neighbor. To do so from any other motive is itself a violation of the laws of justice. But these are the laws of justice, right? They're based on resentment. It's not so clear what, uh, what sentiment uh, economic policy uh, would be based on, although there was an argument saying maybe partly utilitarianism, but, but it's not so clear, I don't think. So there is a, a disjunction still, I think, uh, between the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. But I argue that a key thing from the theory of moral sentiments, of course, is we can imagine how an impartial spectator would view capitalism as a system. This is apparently what Smith did. The bulk of Smith's criticisms of his capitalism centered on what we may call the mercantile state. Some of his contemporary state's laws, rules, and regulations were merely out of date and should be scrapped. Thus, quote, laws frequently continue in force long after the circumstances which first gave occasion to them and which could alone render them reasonable are no more. So thus, uh, Smith then is not some kind of Burkean conservative. 
as he told his students on his lectures on jurisprudence, quote, it is absurd to, be, to preserve in people a regard for their old customs when the causes of them are removed. But many of the laws concerning economic policy in his day are actually the bulk of the economic or mercantile system were made by and for the interests of the rich and powerful people, business people, the capitalists. Regarding these extremely clever fellows, quote, as during their whole lives they are engaged in plans and projects, they frequently have more acuteness of understanding than the greater part of country gentlemen. As their thoughts, however, are commonly exercised rather about the interests of their own particular branch of business than about that of their society, their judgment, even when given with the greatest candor, which it has not been upon every occasion, is much more to be depended upon with regard to the former of these two objects than with regard to the latter. Continuing the quote, the interest of the dealers, however, in any particular branch of trade or manufacturers is always in some respects different from and even opposite to that of the public. To narrow their competition can serve only to enable the dealers by raising their profits about what they would naturally be to levy for their own benefit an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow citizens. The proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order, the business people ought always to be listened to with great precaution and ought never to be adopted till after having long and carefully examined not only with the most scrupulous but with the most suspicious attention. It comes from an order of men who generally have an interest to deceive and oppress the public and who accordingly have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it. End of quote. So Smith, using his own impartial spectator and being as fair as he could to his hard-working business leaders, concludes their full of sophistry. They have a tendency to lie, mislead, oppress the public. In Smith's attempt at a just view, he says, quote, it cannot be very difficult to determine who have been the contrivers of this whole economic mercantile system, not the consumer we may believe whose interests have been entirely neglected, but the producers whose interests have been so carefully attended to. And among this latter class, our merchants and manufacturers have been by far the principal architects. In the mercantilist regulations, the interest of our manufacturers has been most peculiarly attended to, end of quote. Or again, it is the industry, quote, that's carried on for the benefit of the rich and of the powerful that is principally encouraged by our mercantile system. That which is carried on for the benefit of the poor and, and, and indigent is too often either neglected or oppressed. Currently, I think following Smith's example, we should in all fairness turn to our own imagined impartial spectator and ask ourselves now, is this what's happening in today's society? Billion dollar bailouts for our hardworking, clever bankers, insurers, and other enterprising projectors in the financial services industry? And lower wages, higher taxes, cuts in government services for the working middle and former middle classes? Smith's impartial spectator saw a major problem in his society, quote, the monopoly which our manufacturers have obtained against us, this monopoly has so much increased the number of some particular tribes of them that like an overgrown standing army, they have become formidable to the government and upon many occasions intimidate the legislature. The member of parliament who supports every proposal for strengthening this monopoly is sure to acquire not only the reputation of understanding trade, but great popularity and influence with an order of men whose numbers and wealth render them of great importance. If he opposes them on the contrary, and still more if he has the authority enough to be able to thwart them, neither the most acknowledged probity, nor the highest rank, nor the greatest public services can protect him from the most infamous abuse and detraction from personal insults, nor sometimes from real danger arising from the insolent outrage of furious and disappointed monopolists." End of quote. In all fairness, we too need to ask the impartial spectator in our breast, is this what's happening today? Are politicians in North America and Europe, particularly Southern Europe, who dare to stand up to the lies, sophistry, and self-interest of our big business and financial leaders being vilified and abused by their elites and or their higher representatives? Smith's impartial spectator caused him to be concerned about, quote, the mean rapacity, the monopolizing spirit of merchants and manufacturers who neither are nor ought to be the rulers of mankind, end of quote. In all fairness and justice, should not this be a major concern of ours today? As in Smith's day, are our mercantile commercial leaders being excessively greedy and plundering us? Note that while Smith was attacking the rules and regulations by and for the mercantile state, he would not necessarily have been against rules and regulations to protect the working class. Arguably, he may very well have been in favor of a liberal welfare state. People have been talking about this, like Rothschild and, and Fleischacher. 
quote, according to Smith's impartial spectator, quote, whenever the legislature attempts to regulate the differences between masters and their workmen, its counselors are always the masters. When the regulation, therefore, is in favor of the workmen, it is always just and equitable, but it is sometimes otherwise when in favor of the masters. I think I'll, I'll start in the future, I'm going to write something up. I think we almost need to do a platonic or a barbarian, barbarian sort of ideal, types of ideal states, a uh, liberal welfare state, a mercantile state, a garrison state. And then what's going on in our state? It's some kind of combination of these. I, I think that's, that's really what, how we should look at the state. But let me go on. Uh, problems with religious, fundamentalist enthusiasts. For Smith, science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. And where all the superior ranks of people were secured from it, the inferior ranks could not be much exposed to it. By enthusiasm, Smith referred to the followers of austere religious sects. Enthusiasm was a common, rather common derogatory term in the 18th century for the perceived excessive religious zeal and fanaticism of the early Methodist and other religious groups. It denoted ill-regulated or misdirected religious emotion by what we would now call puritanical or fundamentalist religious movements. Note how, ba how Smith basically equates austere fundamentalist religious sects to enthusiasm and then enthusiasm to poison. Smith's impartial spectator was against, quote, melancholy and gloomy humor, which is almost always the nurse of popular superstition and enthusiasm. Smith feared the religion of the poor who attracted to these fundamental Christian movements. The leaders of these sects were excessive. Following Aristotle, excessiveness is always a vice for Smith. Quote, many of them, perhaps a greater part of them, have even endeavored to gain credit by refining upon this austere system and by carrying it to some degree of folly and extravagance. End of quote. For Smith, these austere sects primarily composed of the poor. They tend to be dangerous, and one needs to beware of, quote, popular, though perhaps stupid and ignorant enthusiasts. Enthusiasts, end of quote. In today's globalized commercial society, we may well follow Smith's example and ask our own imagined and partial spectator, to what extent today should we be concerned not only with the dangerous excesses of overly austere Christian fundamentalists, but also Jewish and Islamic fundamentalists? Moreover, to what extent are the dangerous follies of austere religious ideas seeping into and giving support to the dangerous follies of failed austere economic ideas, ideas and policies which are now perhaps ironically hurting the poor worldwide and creating more poor? It's interesting, we have the same word, austere, for policies increasing unemployment and poverty in parts of Europe and austere for these religious sects. Problems with our managers and managerial capitalism. <clears throat> Smith thought very little of the managerial abilities or even the honesty of corporate managers. As the late John Kenneth Galbraith, one of the few people who noted this side of Smith, pointed out, Smith quite likely would have been appalled at our system of managerial capitalism. For example, in discussing the East India Company, Smith wrote of, quote, of all the extraordinary waste which the fraud and abuse inseparable from the management of the affairs of so great a company must necessarily have occasioned. So the managers will be incompetent. Managers tend to rack up enormous expense accounts since, quote, the directors of such companies, however, being the managers rather of other people's money than their own, it cannot be expected that they should watch over it with the same anxious vigilance with which the partners in a private co-partnery frequently watch over their own. Like the stewards of a rich man, they are apt to consider attention to small matters as not for their master's honor and very easily give themselves dispensation from it. Negligence and profusion, therefore, must always be very more or less in the management of the affairs of such a company, end of quote. Basically, Smith thought that without the protection of government-supported monopolies, manager-controlled companies could not compete. Hence, neither could a system of managerial capitalism. So, for example, in discussing the South Sea Company, Smith wrote that, quote, they had an immense capital divided among immense number of proprietors. It was naturally to be expected, therefore, that falling negligence and profusion should prevail in the whole management of their affairs. And some more quotes about that, same lines farther down. Sometimes the professional managers would be, even be supported in their misconduct, their crookedness, and their plundering of the corporation by the owners themselves. Quote, it might be more agreeable to the company that their servants and dependents should have either the pleasure of wasting or the profit of embezzling whatever surplus might remain after paying the proposed dividend of 8%. The interests of those servants and dependents might so far predominate in the courts of proprietors as sometimes to dispose it to, su to support the authors of depredations 
which had been committed in direct violation of its own authority, end of quote. Seeing the plundering of state property by the new Russian managers, quote, oligarchs, seeing the enormous revenues the leading managers, the CEOs and CFOs of corporate enterprises are allocating to themselves around the world in today's globalized commercial society, we might well follow Smith's example and scrutinize anew the proclivities of this managerial elite. We may turn to our own internal impartial spectators and ask ourselves, are what they are doing just? Is it fair? Or are they just using their place in the system, possibly with the aid of their friends in government, to unduly enrich themselves? If so, then how do we control our own managers? Smith thought the competition from non-managerial controlled enterprises would put these larger managerial enterprises out of business. Clearly, this has not happened. Smith was wrong on this. Finally, problems with economic growth, climate change, and capitalism destruction, destruction of the institutional structures which support it. Smith, of course, was for economic growth because with economic growth, the demand for labor would go up, and so would real wages and the living standard for workers would rise. Yet, do we really need that now? It's not so clear, particularly in the advanced capitalist countries, but even more, can the earth and its rapidly changing environment even support continuous economic growth? More is better is what we still teach at Intro Micro. Moreover, as the profound 20th century economist John Kenneth Galbraith explained a generation ago, in this sense with his vision, Galbraith is sort of the 20th century answer to Smith, in my opinion. For Galbraith, big government and big strong labor unions were historically developed to act as countervailing powers to the power of big managerial business. What is happening today, though, is big business and its hired representatives are currently using or misusing Smith's legacy as an ideological persuasive tool in their well-endowed fight to eliminate these potential countervailing powers. I've actually been in a debate with someone who claims Smith is a libertarian. This is particularly evident in the United States where there are admirably well-financed efforts in the United States to smash all labor unions and to shut down the federal government and to deny the government either the tax revenues or the ability to borrow, created only uh, by itself at basically zero cost but they're trying to shut down the government to run effectively. Others have called attention to the tendency for temporarily successful forms of relatively laissez-faire capitalism to attack the social structures which support society, leading almost necessarily to either social welfare reforms or else perhaps more ominously fascist or communist or socialist revolutions. Think of Polanyi and Schumpeter, opposite sides of the ideological spectrum. Today, the most shocking, destructive manifestation of capitalism attack on the social structures which support it is that parts of our business leaders and their paid surrogates, <coughs> particularly businessmen in the fossil fuel industry, have been attacking natural science itself and, of course, the natural scientists itself. For decades, natural scientists have pointed out that the Earth's climate is changing, that change is caused by humans, especially by the burning of fossil fuels. In response, basically phony debates are staged with corporate fossil fuel industry back pseudoscientists who first deny climate change, then I can't deny that, so now they deny that the climate change is caused by humans, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, and then they say even if that's true, there's basically nothing that we can do about it or should do about it. Rather than face the necessity of relatively quickly shutting down their industries and humankind's urgent need to develop alternative energy supplies, they and their hired heads attack natural science and natural scientists themselves. My own impartial spectator is amazed. So the earth warms up. The storms get more violent and severe. The earth's glaciers are melting. The oceans are rising. Gulf Atlantic and Pacific coast are savaged by storms. Not good, either for ourselves or more importantly, our children. Meanwhile, in the comparative short run, our fossil fuel industry continues to rake in their socially and naturally destructive profits. So in conclusion, Following Smith, my impartial spectator says we need to somehow control the capitalist mercantilist state and the businessmen who unduly influence it. We need to beware and somehow deal with the austere, enthusiastic, fundamentalist, religious fanatics in our midst. Also, we need to somehow control our managers in this current system of managerial capitalism. General Motors covering up uh, basically involved killing people. Uh, any students out there, don't try to do that if you're not in a major corporate enterprise. Uh, you'll go to jail. Uh, so we need to control our managers. Furthermore, watching as big business attacks the potentially countervailing powers of unions in a strong, relatively independent state, as well as now even science itself, 
it is not too clear to me how sustainable the current system of capitalism is. My impartial spectator says the future of this system of capitalism looks quite bleak, and perhaps we need to consider and develop alternatives to it quickly, too. What does your impartial spectator say? Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter McNamara, uh, who is, uh, teaches political theory at uh, Utah State University. His PhD is from Boston College, uh, and he specializes in early modern and American political thought. Uh, current research projects includes working on the intellectual origins of business schools. So, welcome. <coughs> Well, thank you for coming. Um, I, I think my advertised title was um, Smith on Markets and Morality. I've narrowed that down a lot. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, Smith on the, the issue of inequality. Wealth and income inequality, uh, along with the closely, closely associated question of social mobility, are clearly emerging as major political issues uh, in the United States and across the world. Uh, there's little debate about the fact that income and wealth disparities have risen markedly in recent decades. There is more uncertainty as to uh, whether there has been a decline in economic mobility. Uh, there is, however, um, considerable debate about just why these trends have emerged. Moreover, there is also vigorous debate, uh, both moral and economic, about whether these trends or what parts of them are matters for real concern. Uh, some uh, policy analysts, uh, economists, uh, have made some very radical proposals or radical proposals. Uh, recently, Thomas Piketty, who has this big book that's just come out on uh, in, uh, wealth and income inequality, uh, advocates a, a global tax on wealth as the only way to deal with uh, what he sees as a um, an ever widening trend, uh, ever uh, increasing trend towards inequality. And you might think also of President Obama's emphasis on income inequality uh, and his various tax proposals uh, to deal with it. Um, I think Smith uh, can shed some light on these, this contemporary debate. Uh, and what I intend to do uh, is to focus on uh, Smith's wealth of nations uh, and especially his chapter on wages. Um, and see what we might learn from it. Um, now, if one sort of particular uh, uh, sort of motive uh, to, for doing this or having this focus, uh, Smith is sometimes portrayed today as a proto-Rawlsian, um, and um, I, I don't think that's correct. Uh, there are some reason, there are some good reasons why people think this. Uh, Smith's concern for the little guy. Uh, his critique of businessmen, which we <laughs> heard a great deal about uh, from Professor Pack, and it was very, very accurate. Uh, also, some of Smith's recommendations uh, with regard to public education uh, and so on. Um, uh, and his, some of his recommendations as regards taxes, as tax policy as well. Um, those things are true. But um, I think there are very big differences between Smith and Rawls, uh, and I'd particularly like to sort of bring them out by discussing the question of the uh, inequality, uh, uh, inequality and, and alongside it, Smith's argument for economic growth. Um, so um, I, I'm going to do this. There are two caveats to what I'm going to say, um, and let me uh, just mention them briefly. One is. Uh, there have been big changes in economic structure since Smith's time, the structure of industry, uh, the structure of the family. I think we have to take that into account as well. Uh, and secondly, we shouldn't forget uh, that Smith was not writing for a democratic society. Uh, and I think maybe some adjustments have to be made there as well. But those are two caveats. Uh, we can maybe discuss them uh, in the question period. Uh, so. Um, what was Smith's argument for economic growth, and how does it relate to this question of inequality? 
Uh, Smith doesn't make one of the most common arguments today for supporting economic growth, uh, namely uh, that it allows for, permits uh, upward social mobility. Uh, Smith is aware of the phenomenon, but it's not a major part of his argument. Uh, in fact, Smith seems to accept uh, a, consider a certain considerable class stratification in society, uh, and he not only accepts it, he seems content with it. Uh, one does not find in Smith the confident uh, and positive pronouncements one finds in uh, someone like Daniel Defoe, who about 50 years before the writing of The Wealth of Nations, uh, The Wealth of Nations was published, uh, wrote as follows, uh, as trade is now flourishing in England and increasing, it is very probable a few years will show us a still greater race of trade-bred gentlemen than England ever yet had. So Defoe looks forward to this uh, 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 bright future where people are rising from the lowest ranks uh, to being gentlemen. You don't find that in Smith. Uh, when Smith does talk about upward social mobility, uh, it's not uh, often, not in very flattering terms. And I think here especially the famous passage in the Theory of Moral Sentiments where he talks about the poor man's son who's uh, cursed with ambition uh, and lives a life of uh, um, continual struggle uh, uh, and ultimately dies unhappy, regretting uh, how he spent his life. Uh, one finds in Smith, though, three kinds of arguments in favor of economic growth. Uh, let's call them the independence or dignity argument, the freedom argument, and the happiness argument. Uh, the first two arguments uh, relate to uh, market societies as a whole, in general. The, the last one, uh, in, but the last one, the happiness argument, relates to um, uh, market societies with economic growth. Uh, Marie, uh, Maria went over some of the first two arguments, so you'll forgive me if there's some uh, overlap. Uh, when explaining how self-interest rather than government design uh, acts to extend the division of labor, so I'm going to take up the first argument, the um, independence or dignity argument. When explaining how self-interest rather than government uh, design acts to extend the division of labor, Smith makes his famous contrast between actions and mo uh, motivated by self-interest, self-love, and those mo motivated by benevolence. Uh, for the students in the audience, uh, you might have realized it's almost mandatory to quote this uh, statement whenever you give a paper on Adam Smith. Uh, so I'm going to quote it, uh, just to fulfill my professional obligation. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not uh, to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the beneficence of his fellow citizens. Uh, this famous and complex statement makes clear the necessary conditions for economic exchange, namely mutual self-interest. Uh, but there are other important elements to the statement as well, which I'd, I'd like to focus on. Uh, first, the statement is limited in scope. Uh, it doesn't rule out benevolence. Uh, second, and more important for present purposes, Smith distinguishes between a state of dependence and a state of independence. State of independence is where the individual relies for his or her livelihood uh, sorry, sorry, a state of dependence uh, is where an individual relies for his livelihood on the goodwill of another. In the extreme, a slave is without any independence. He is absolutely dependent, Smith's words. His subsistence is in the hands of another and is proportioned, Smith's wor Smith words, to daily necessities. Independence, by contrast, implies not equality of wealth, but the ability to make one's own way in the world. The spread of commerce, or it amounts to the same thing, economic growth, contributes to enhancing, according to Smith, independence and dignity. Smith does allow, and this is one of the few times he does talk uh, positively about uh, social mobility, Smith does allow that in prosperous, t prosperous times, day laborers and factory workers may become independent workmen, as opposed to being employees. Uh, 
which uh, is a kind of upward mobility, both in terms of income and, interestingly for Smith, moral character. Smith uh, 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 continues, the, the separate and independent workman, as distinct from the hired worker, is less subject to, quote, bad company uh, that often ruins the morals of workers in large manufactories. Uh, so that's a kind of upward mobility, but not between classes. Within the same class, um, uh, um, and not the kind of upward mobility we tend to talk about today. Um, one last point about the dignity argument. Uh, it's worth noting that when Smith defines the task of political economy at the beginning of book four, the task, sorry, of political economy at the beginning of book four, uh, when it's, he talks about political economy considered as a practical science, uh, he describes one of its chief goals as creating the circumstances where people can provide a revenue or subsistence for themselves. Uh, so one of the goals of political economy, according to Smith, has uh, not just a practical political angle to it, but a moral angle, making the citizens, providing the circumstances in which they can be independent. Uh, this in argument for independence or dignity is closely connected uh, to the argument for liberty. Uh, this argument has a, a political and a personal dimension. Uh, one of the great historical claims of the wealth of nations uh, is that the spread of commerce has also spread independence by replacing feudal institutions uh, with relations between nobles and common people with contractual relationships, or as Marx called it, the cash nexus. Uh, Maria spoke about this. Smith sees this shift as expanding not just economic liberty, but also political liberty, because with greater independence of the, with the greater independence of the common people, comes a corresponding decline in the power of the nobility. The largely arbitrary rule of the nobility is replaced by the freer, more orderly, and more uh, by a freer, more orderly, and more secure system of laws. The personal dimension of liberty. Uh, this, up, this part of Smith's argument is perhaps more interesting for our present purposes. Smith stresses how actions that increase economic growth by freeing up the market increase the freedom of workers uh, to move between jobs to exploit economic and exploit the economic possibilities available to them. Now, uh, as uh, Spencer pointed out, uh, Smith uh, is very critical of uh, rules and regulations that prevent this. Uh, and he remarks as follows, that the, uh, uh, that prevent allowing workers to take the maximum uh, uh, benefit that comes from uh, economic opportunities that are available, uh, and especially opportunities made possible by economic growth. The property which every man, this is uh, Smith, the property which every man has in his own labor as it is the original foundation of all other property, so it is the most sacred and inviolable. The patrimony of a poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his hands, the patrimony in the sense of inheritance. And to hinder him from empl employing this strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper without injury to his neighbor is a plain violation of this most sacred property. It is a manifest encroachment upon that just liberty both of the workmen and of those who might be disposed to employ him. The worker's sole inheritance, his labor, must be protected, says Smith, uh, Smith argues, uh, as fully as any other kind of inheritance. Um, okay. Um, now, Smith, uh, in The Wealth of Nations, frequently does rail against inequality. Uh, but it's not the kind of inequality that we're talking about in contemporary political debates. It's the kind of inequality that's brought about by bad uh, and usually unjust policies, uh, where one group of workers or one group of producers are favored over another. Uh, laws that protect certain industries or restrict entry into certain trades or restrict the movement of labor or favor the town over the country are all counterproductive, uh, not only counterproductive, but in Smith's view, unjust. Um, now, Smith, Smith does make one curious exception uh, to this general rule and his general attack on this kind of inequality. Uh, 
uh, in the case of that unprosperous race of men, uh, unprosperous race commonly called men of letters, that is to say educators, uh, Smith argues uh, that it is on balance a benefit to the public that subsidies, that the subsidies that draw so many uh, into uh, the educational field, um, he thinks they should probably be continued, um, even though they result uh, in the price of their labor, namely educators, being reduced to a very paltry recompense. Uh, we have to take one for the team, according to Adam Smith, um, uh, those professors out there in the audience. Um, Smith's final argument in favor of economic growth uh, that I will mention concerns the general effects of economic growth on society, particularly as regards the happiness of most of its citizens. The most significant discussion uh, of this in the Wealth of Nations occurs in the chapter on wages. The, now, Smith. Uh, Smith's account of the wage bargain, how it's arrived at, is not pretty. Uh, the wage bargain is a, the result of a power struggle uh, between labor and capital. Uh, and Smith is at pains to highlight the unusually usually harsh nature of this struggle uh, and to point out the advantages that capitalists have in the struggle. Capitalists can, can com, 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 combine, that's uh, Smith's term, together to keep wages down whereas the law prevents workers from combining to push wages up. Moreover, capitalists have the resources to outlast workers in any protracted conflict. Workers often result, resort to violence and outrage when wages are depressed. They are, uh, quote, they are desperate and act with the folly and extravagance of desperate men who must either starve or frighten their masters into an immediate compliance with their demands. So it's not a pretty picture. Uh, to go back to something Charles Griswold was saying yesterday, uh, if one reads back those kind of passages into the, the passage about the break, baker and the brewer, um, uh, you might get a slightly different take on the, the interactions between those two uh, as well. Uh, now, it is economic growth, what Smith calls the progressive state of society, that turns the tables on the capitalists. Economic growth, by increasing the demand for labor, breaks up the combination uh, that the usually secret or tacit agreement among employers to depress wages, uh, and it offsets the advantages employers have in terms of resources, uh, because the demand for labor uh, makes, uh, makes it possible to, makes possible to, uh, for workers to increase their bargaining strength. Uh, Smith argues at length against the common opinion um, that uh, low wages are good. That's one of the great purposes of the chapter, uh, as a, uh, that low wages are good uh, for the economy as a whole uh, and good for keeping workers industrious. Smith, in contrast, sees the liberal reward of labor, increasing wages, as a natural, con natural consequence of economic growth uh, and, for that reason, something to be welcomed rather than feared. Uh, in addition to the obvious benefits to the nation of economic growth, Smith adds the following. No society can, be tr no, no society can truly be happy and uh, flourishing, of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. miserable. It is but equity, uh, besides, that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. Uh, so, in what does the happiness of the lower classes consist uh, when there's economic growth? Uh, as, he, as I just read, certain standard of living, uh, a decline in child <laughs> mortality. Uh, Smith believes that one of the um, uh, as he puts it, the decisive mark of prosperity in any society is an increasing population. Uh, and that comes about in his account as a result of declining child mortality. Um, now, um, what does uh, this make possible? The liberal reward of labor as it encourages the propagation so it increases the industry of the common people. The wages of labor are the encouragement of industry, 
which, like every other human quality, improves in proportion to the encouragement it receives. A plentiful subsistence increases the bodily strength of the laborer, and, and this is what I'd like to stress, the comfortable hope of bettering his condition and of ending his days in ease and plenty animates him to exert his strength to the utmost. Uh, so the workers are working hard, but they're happy as well. Uh, they're happy not just because they're uh, well, better fed, better clothed, their children are living rather than dying, but because they're full of hope and optimism about the future. Uh, the progressive state of society, Smith says, is, the ch is cheerful and hearty. The progressive state of society is the happiness, the most comfortable. Uh, by contrast, the stationary uh, uh, state of society uh, is dull, the declining state, uh, melancholy. Now, uh, let me conclude. The idea that there's something proto-Rawlsian about Smith does, deserve, does have a kernel of truth uh, to it and not an insignificant one. Smith's favoring of the progressive state does improve the condition of workers, the lowest, least uh, advantage group in society, uh, and it does squeeze profits and so enforces a kind of frugality uh, and humanity upon capitalists. Uh, having said this, there's a great deal that is not correct about Sm the view of Smith as a proto-Rawlsian, and as I try to suggest, it comes out most in Smith's account of economic growth. Rawls famously quiet on the subject of economics, uh, and, um, but he does say that um, a just society is compatible with a kind of stationary state. Uh, let me suggest three reasons um, why, uh, uh, in, in, in conclusion, why you, we shouldn't look at Smith as a proto-Rawlsian. Uh, although Smith was perhaps a first, although Smith was perhaps the first philosopher to lay out in detail the way in which the free market is a system of cooperation. What he has in mind is something quite different from what Rawls imagines as a fair system of cooperation. The system of cooperation Smith has in mind liberates individuals from dependence on others, whether as slaves or employees. Second, Smith holds to the classical liberal idea of self-ownership. This idea explains the rhetoric and substance of his critique of the mercantile system. Uh, lastly, it seems to me that Smith's moral uh, theory, the theory of moral sentiments, says that beyond a certain point, wealth has no or little influence on human happiness. So once you've reached a certain standard of living uh, in uh, a society in which there's economic growth, it really doesn't matter uh, how much inequality there is in society. We measure ourselves on the basis of what our equals, our peers, uh, our peer group regard as necessary for happiness, not what the 1% regard as necessary. Thank you. I'll start us off. Um, Spencer, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm persuaded of the legitimacy of your appropriation of Smith for a fairly radical critique of contemporary capitalism. And it does seem to me that, first of all, uh, you describe Smith himself as a critic of the capitalism of his day, although uh, I'm uncomfortable with that terminology because it seems to me he's a critic of mercantilism, which is not exactly capitalism. It's not, uh, he's a critic precisely of the propensity in mercantilism uh, to, to structure economic relations not as a market, but, you know, based on other kinds of criteria. And then it seems to me you proceed, and accurately so, to, to list the many, many uh, critical comments in Smith about the behavior of merchants or capitalists. But there's a fundamental difference between criticizing capitalists and criticizing capitalism, right? Because if, if uh, I think Smith was all too aware that uh, merchants get together to conspire and, and cartelize and do things like that, but of course capitalism is precisely a critique of cartelization, uh, an attempt to uh, uh, to bring markets to bear and distributing economic resources. And so, um, you know, I, I understand the sort of thrust of your critique in general. I guess I'm just wondering whether Smith really uh, can be appropriately, uh, you, can, you can do this under the banner of Smith, uh, 
and maybe a couple of very specific examples. For instance, you're, you're skeptical about uh, compensation levels, presumably for managerial personnel, but presumably Smith would favor the market. That is to say, allow uh, talented managers to get uh, whatever the market would bear in terms of a salary. If you want to harness Smith for a more redistributive project, um, I mean, Peter does mention that, that uh, Smith was quite critical of inequalities derivative, again, from unjust privileges intruding into the market, but I don't see in Smith a kind of critique of the market, of market distribution of resources that you seem to want to find in them. So. Uh, let me have three answers for that. First of all, with, with the managers, I'd say there's basically two ways to look at compensation for managers now. Uh, one is especially neoclassical microeconomics, which isn't quite the same as, as Smith's classical, but, but what you say is, is close enough, I, I, I think, that, that in neoclassical economics, you're awarded according to your productivity. If you're making a billion or so dollars, that must mean you brought a billion or so dollars into the firm. Okay? But there is another uh, aspect of managerial capitalism, uh, and it actually is in Smith, that these people are criminals, that they're basically robbing the corporation and they're robbing the stockholders, and he thinks they won't last. Okay? Now, clearly, it looks to me, if we look at Soviet ex-Soviet Union, uh, Russia, the oligarchs, those guys are criminals, okay? Uh, and crony capitalism is another issue. Go for the next 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 year. Uh, the technological change with fiat money and internet money. It's so easy. It's so easy to to, to have crony capitalism. Uh, so yeah, the managers may very well be robbing us. Uh, as far as capitalism itself, you have to talk about different types of capitalism, right? So. Galbraith's vision of capitalism, for example, uh, was one of countervailing powers, uh, and you had big business, and you needed big labor, and, and big government, and social welfare state uh, to countervail it. So it's not just capitalism, anti-capitalism. Uh, and then the third thing is, uh, is sort of history. So I'm looking at history now, and as I say, also, you know, I think there's disjunctions we could talk about between the theory of moral sentiments, the wealth of nations, but clearly you can try to be impartial. I think that's what Smith's doing to describe the system we have. And when I look at the system, I think, okay, we had uh, the Great Depression, the crash in 1929, 10 bad years, the Great Depression, 1939, World War II. We have the financial problem, 2007, 2008. It's not a Great Depression, but it's called a Great Recession. Things are looking pretty dicey, is what I think. Not good. And if this goes on to 2017, 2018, bad things. Similarly, the other th things that this reminds me of is the decade before World War I. Many people were saying, this is nuts. We're going to have a war. Bad things are happening. You know, it wasn't just Rosa Luxemburg and the communists, but other people as well saying, bad things are happening. Th things are going to happen. And they did happen. You had World War I. Similar thing now, I have, it's like, look at these hurricanes, look at the weather, and we're being told we're not doing anything. There's plenty of people saying, saying bad things are going to happen. And, uh, and of course, yeah, as I said, it's a phony debate, I think, financed by especially the fossil fuel industry. Businessmen, too much power. Could either of the other panelists like to comment on that? Did you want to? Could I just say something just about managers? Um, I, I mentioned one of my caveats was that Smith's idea, you know, Smith's account is based on a, an economy that's very different from our own, um, and the corp, you know, the structure of corporations is different. Um, that's something that ha does have to be taken into account, and the, and the warnings that you, you mentioned. Uh, I would say, but also. Smith might just be wrong about some things um, uh, as well. Um, as one of his uh, admirers, but also a critic, uh, Say uh, argued, Smith doesn't really understand entrepreneurship. It's just not part of his account of how the economy works. Uh, and I think that's a, big, that's a big defect in Smith's account of um, businessmen uh, and the rewards they receive and so on. So you have to factor that in uh, as well. Um, the, the, so the, where things have changed and where Smith was wrong. So 
I find myself conflicted because I see both um, Spencer's point and Don's point. Um, and uh, the criticism that Spencer is giving us, um, that Smith makes, it does make. But on the other hand, Smith never uses the word capitalism. He uses commercial societies uh, or mercantile society, which is a degeneration of a specific aspect of commercial society. So while I, I hold Spencer's point um, as correct, I also see the fact that the word capitalism has a very specific uh, connotation that is absent in Smith. So it is a little bit, I find myself uncomfortable in, in using Smith as a critic of capitalism because that's not his frame of mind. Um, while it may, and it's definitely in favor of commercial society while against mercantile society, um, which can be a degenerative form of commercial society. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, echo what I frequently hear from callers on NPR shows. Great show, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, in that regard, on, on the way in, uh, you know, I was thinking about your story now in relation to that. The cover story on uh, this month's issue of the Atlantic magazine is about the overprotected child. And the way you started your comments on protecting them, but then the idea that the society of strangers was you know the best kind of thing. Maybe you want to communicate with the writer of that article in the Atlantic Magazine. Now, uh, specifically, um, I, I have a question about the virtue ethics. And uh, Spencer, I wonder how you would respond to uh, Deirdre McCluskey's argument that uh, Hume and Smith effectively banished the virtues of, uh, of hope and faith in the comment about the happiness of workers and discussing hope and optimism, we could look at optimism as faith. Um, what would you say to McCloskey about that uh, uh, comment that uh, she makes? In the wealthy nations? Yeah, the, 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 the theory more well, well, so. Just okay. the, you know, Deirdre McCloskey, you may or may not. The bourgeois virtues. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Now, you know, in her work, she argues that, that Smith, like Hume, when they talk about virtues, they banish the virtues of hope and faith from the comment about you know, the workers and their happiness involving hope and optimism. Is that an indication that Smith, contrary to what uh, McCloskey says, uh, did not banish those virtues and, in fact, thought the virtues of hope and faith were very important? Well, in, in general, uh, in my opinion, so many of these virtues, and they're basically incommensurable, I think, for the most part, in the theory of moral sentiments, but then some of them are in the wealth of nations, but basically he says, he conflates everything because he says, you know, most people want status, and for the great mob of mankind, uh, the way you get status is you make more money, okay? So then he goes on his way, and that is the thrust. Right. Whereas in the theory of moral sentiments, as Ryan talks about in his work and others here too, that there's all these virtues, and and they're important. So, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by faith, but certainly hope and just physical health. Right. You don't want people to be sick; they're going to be splenetic. Right. So there's all kinds of issues going on on with with Smith, but uh, uh, yeah, as I said. There are these differences in the theory of moral sentiments and wealth of nations on, on issues such as that and others too. And so uh, let me just finally say, I guess, clearly you read the lectures on jurisprudence, you know the same guy who wrote the two books because the lectures on jurisprudence begins at the end of theory of moral sentiments and talking about resentment and justice and stuff. The end of the lectures of jurisprudence basically begins at book one of, of, of the wealth of nations and stuff. So there it is. But still, Smith never put the system in the middle, he didn't, he didn't write it, and as we could talk about later, there's all kinds of differences in emphasis and audience, in my opinion, between the two books. Maybe there the other, yeah. 
Um, I know absolutely nothing about hope and faith, <laughs> uh, so I'm afraid I cannot comment on it. As far as the overprotected child of today, um, I, I mean, Smith tells you that the, um, the first school of self-command is kindergarten. Uh, because a child is exposed to other children where, and so you start to realize that he's not the center of the universe and has to protect himself against the anger of other children, as opposed to instead the caregiver who indulged the child into his, his passions. Um, and today, in many ways, there is a lot of protection of children, as well as adults for that matter, um, that shelter you from this, your exposure to others or to strangers in particular. So it's a very, you can think of it in self-selecting the people with whom you interact um, much more than possibly in Smith's time, which limits the contact with strangers. Carson? Yeah, I enjoyed that panel. Uh, I probably would like to hear more about the trust issue and how the market increases that. Uh, and the experiment, because my experience with car salesmen never seems to do that, <laughs> but uh, that might be just the exception. Uh, but but bringing these panels together, maybe the first the first ones and uh, Charles's talk, so it seems to me as if one could say the following. Uh, so the standard of evaluation that develops with markets, there is a standard that allows us to take a critical perspective on the markets itself, and that is. Uh, the development and uh, so the standard is kind of human dignity and the question of whether uh, people are judged on their merit and propriety, which is really a new phenomenon. And Smith wants to say that market economy kind of universalizes those standards throughout the world. They allow us to treat each other with dignity and to basically judge each other in terms of propriety from the impartial spectator perspective in terms of merit. Uh, and that's the great hope, it seems to me. So it's not the utilitarianism, maybe, that is in Smith in terms of maximizing happiness, but maximizing the scope of dignity, if, if maybe one may just say it. And then one could say that the inequality that we have is it's not so much that it is unequal it's completely without merit. Because what you have in, in, in terms of these bankers and these uh, golden parachutes is they get them regardless of how they perform. There's, it has absolutely nothing to do with how they perform, etc. Et so the, the, the point is there is something too, there is something appalling about the dignity of all of that that allows us, I think, to take a kind of stance towards it. And that's the stance that itself was basically brought into existence through the market. But so, so there is maybe this critical uh, stance that the markets themselves allow us to develop, and that plays out to a certain extent throughout civil rights movement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, um, so, so, so we, we, we're trying, deciding who's going to speak. Uh, yeah. Just uh, on the question of, I, I, I agree very much, and I agree with Spencer about the, the uh, in, in part anyway, about the, um, the problem of high incomes that aren't merited. Um, now, that's sometimes, you know, people have, you know, make a lot of money just out of luck. Uh, but that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem to be what's going on at the moment. It it seems to be much more um, uh, contrived than that, and, um, um, and especially in the in the financial sector, this just sort of one of the things that struck me about the the recent crisis was uh, that the, this, this big you know um, economic upheaval, uh, but. You know, before the upheaval and after the upheaval, the same people are still yeah. running the show. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in, um, you know, in a, in a free market, those guys would have gone out of business rather than being bailed out. Uh, you know, in China or someplace, they would have been shot. Um, so it, 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 it does, you know, cast a 
you know, the, 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 I think this, it's, you know, there is a real uh, genuine basis for concern about some of the income inequality uh, we see today. Uh, you know, a lot of the increase in inequality we've seen over the last few years has been just, you know, huge uh, incomes in the finance sector. Um, and, you know, what's that the result of? You know, Fed policy, uh, the, you know, the too big to fail uh, attitude of the government with regard to the, the big banks. Uh, so, you know, I, I, we, we have an intersection of views on that. Uh, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of saying that Smith judges on merit and propriety. Because I think that it may be more appropriate to say that for Smith, we judge on glitter, rather than glitter, on what it shines, what attracts people's attention and not necessarily on merit. So we are attracted by what shines, but not by what is good. Is that corruption? I, mean, I, I, think I think that that's just a description of a human being. Then what we should do may be something different, but what we do, the description that Smith gives us, is we are attracted by what shines and not by what is, maybe also by what is good, but it's easier to recognize wealth than to recognize virtue. And so we invest more in wealth than in virtue simply because we attract more approbation by showing off wealth than showing off virtue. So I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that description uh, of human behavior attributed to Smith. Prescription may be the case, but, um, I think that is is like he describes human being as attracted by by wealth because wealth shines because you recognize it easily. Virtue is harder. That may may lead to behaviors that may not be moral. I agree. I think self love for Smith is not immoral because from the impartial spectator perspective. Fully understand why everybody tries to be wealthy. No problem with that. Or if you have to decide between the poor paying job and the well paying job, take the well paying job. No problem whatsoever. Uh, so that's not immoral in any sense. Or, and so there's merit in that. Or, or that it's proper to, to follow oneself up in that context. But there's certainly moments where that. I guess notice another thing. Uh, I mean, it's clear the virtue of prudence, Smith likes that in the wealth of nations, right? Mm -hmm. But, but also, in the wealth of nations, the emphasis is there is there's not a big difference when they're young between the porter and the, the philosopher and the carrier and egalitarian, which I know the people have emphasized. But again, at the same time, you know, in the theory of moral sentiments, you know, most, they're not, most, as has been mentioned, most people aren't going to become philosophers or really highly moral life. And so the, you know, he talks about the great mob of mankind, and he, I don't think those are just throwaway lines. So there is, in this sense, between how most people act in the wealth of nations, and he's egalitarian, but in theory of moral sentiments, yeah, most people are not, you know, they're not going to become moral people. So there's a, there's a much more hierarchy there. Um, Maria, would you mind taking a few minutes and talking a little bit about your experiment and the results? Um, sure. So the is a it, try to model Smith in today's language is extremely difficult because economic language is much more limited than Smith's. So we had to take very broad brushes in a sense. Um, so if you want to test 
whether commercial society, again, not capitalist, uh, commercial society may have a positive impact on morality, you have to work with what we have today, in a sense. So a proxy of, for commercial society for us is exposure to markets. And a proxy for morality is trust. Uh, it's not necessarily, I'm aware of the fact that trust is not morality, but it's as good as we can get at this point, given the tools of experimental economics. And uh, so what we have done is we um, primed um, subjects to market exposure. Priming is a typical uh, technique used in psychology. And the, the way in which you prime somebody is you let them think about something without being conscious about it. And a common technique is to use uh, word arrangements. So you give five words and uh, you ask them, you ask your subjects to make a sentence out of those five words. And uh, in our um, experimental part, we had words that were linked to markets, and in the control were words that were not linked to markets. An example would be uh, park noon opens at, or shop noon open at. So we replace a neutral word with a word that is associated with markets. So we had our control group that had the neutral word in our experimental test that had the market um, priming. And so we ask uh, subjects to, uh, to form these sentences and immediately after, without saying a word of why they were doing this, uh, we ask them to do a trust game. Trust game is a game in which um, I, get, I tell, um, a group of subjects, say, Spencer, I, I tell Spencer, you have $10. You can send any of this $10 to uh, Ryan. And uh, Ryan can, either, can keep whatever you sent uh, or can send back something to you. So if you send a dollar to Ryan, Ryan will actually receive $3 because on the process of going to Ryan is multiplied. And Ryan can keep the three dollars, all of them, or can send you back something. Okay. And uh, the idea is that if uh, you don't trust, you don't send anything because you lose out. Right. So Spencer receives ten dollars if he sent three dollars to Ryan, he, and Ryan doesn't send back anything. He goes home only with seven. On the other hand, if he sent, if he trusts Ryan. Uh, Spencer would send uh, $3 to Ryan. Ryan would uh, receive $9 because it's multiplied. And, uh, um, and hopefully will send back um, $3, $4, or $5, depending on how Ryan feels. Um, so that's the basic idea of, uh, of the trust game. And what we saw is that for the subjects that were exposed to markets, that were primed to markets, uh, the level of trust increased compared to the subject that were primed, or they were not primed. So that's the basic uh, thrust of the, of the game. Do you have to worry at all about this loss aversion with when you receive money, it's harder for you to give it back? Is that factored in? It's, it's constant in both, uh, in both settings, okay. right? Because in both situations, the, the trust game is exactly the same, except, uh, the except for the priming before. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they so should they have make lots of version that should yeah. be. It should be re uh, reflected in both situations. Do we have any other questions? All right, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists very much.